Okay, welcome everybody. Kitzah Shulchan Aruch, the abridged code of Jewish law. We are doing chapter 20. And we are up to number six. No, we did number six. Number seven. Number seven. Okay, number seven. So we were discussing the Chazan's repetition. So after we say the Amidah, the Shemona Esrei, the Chazan repeats it. And uh, number seven, Zion. So after the Chazan repeat, he's finished the repetition. He whispers. So the whole thing he's been saying aloud. Now he whispers that could it be Hashem's will to accept this, this prayer. As we do in our own private Shimon Esrei. Avil, however, the Soya Shalosh Basiyas Enet Sarech. He doesn't take the three steps back. So when we do our own private Shimon Esrei, our own private Amidah, we take three steps back at the end. Shasamacha Basiyash Vasayf Kadash Shalon, because he's relying on the three steps back he's going to take later on. At the end of the Kaddish, that's the end of this section. So as we we said earlier, in earlier chapters, that um, we always say a Kaddish at the end of a section of the davening. So the first part of davening, we, we speak about the, the Kabonis, the different offerings that were brought in by Smikdash, and we have a Kaddish. And then we have the verses of praise with the blessing before and afterwards, and we have a Kaddish. And then we have the Shema and the and and the Shema. So, so various parts in davening. The end of the song of the day, we have a Kaddish. The end of Elaine or the end of davening. So whenever we finish a section, those communities that say Tillim as uh, right <laughs> afterwards, we have Kaddish at the end. So whenever there's the end of a section, we say Kaddish. So although this this Kaddish is not said immediately after the um, Kaddish repetition, we say. Uh, a few we said the Tachnun and um the Ashray over the Sion that we'll mention shortly, probably not today, but we'll get, get there in the next chapter. We um we are going to say a Kaddish, and in that Kaddish, it's uh, the full Kaddish, we're gonna take the three steps back, and because that's the end of the section, and he's gonna take the three steps back then, he doesn't need to take the three steps back at this stage. Okay. Um, number eight, we'll we'll just say outside because we it's it's really a repetition of something we had in the previous chapter. The previous chapter is about additions, and we said on a fast day, we add in the anenu, and um, there was where we added our own shmos where people asking questions. We spoke about the chazan. Says is his own bracha, so that's what we say uh, here. Uh, between between the bracha of uh, so, so he says it before the bracha of um, Rofei Choyle Amo Yisrael. Okay, number nine. Ain Oyrman Tefilashman Esrei Bekol Ela Im Kain Yesh Lachal Pachos. Shisha Anoshim Shevrov Minion Shispal Ata. We can only say a Khan's repetition if we have a minion. And what we're adding here is not only a minion, but we need the majority of the minion. In other words, six um, who have damned now. In other words, the, they were part of the congregation. We have to have a congregation say the Shwan Esrei in order to have a repetition. And the minimum of a, a congregation means we have 10 present and six that actually said the private Shema Esrei together. I will im ein shisha noshis Paul ato. If you didn't have six, even they got 10, even they got a thousand people in the room. Pain oimim kol Shema Esrei bekol ele echod oimid adakela kodesh bekol the oimim kodesh we're going to fossil lachash. You can't do the repetition without six. The only thing you can do is what we uh, call in slang. 
a hoicha kedusha. Right? So let's say there's a, a situation. Let's just use mincha as an example. And uh, there's not going to be six people can daven. Maybe the people can't daven. And so um, you're not going to do the repetition. So what someone does is they start to on private. They start it aloud. And they say the first three blessings aloud and with the Kedusha at the appropriate place. And then they everyone, say it rest, then they say the rest quietly. And everyone else who's going to Daven says their quiet one at the same time. So that's what we could do. Yud, number number 10. Now, kol mokim shiachid im is mispalo. Any situation and we had in previous chapters where if a person makes a mistake, they're going to have to repeat the Shema Esrei. So for an example, instead of, instead of he forgot to pray for the rain or various things we mentioned in earlier chapters, any mistake that's going to cause him to have to do it all over again. So the same rules, exact same rules apply to the Chazan with his repetition. In the repetition, if he made a mistake, he forgot to pray for the rain, or it's Rosh Chodesh, Shachris, and he forgot to say Yalav Yavoy, add in the special prayer Rosh Chodesh, whatever the mistake happens to be, any situation that will cause an individual to go back and repeat, the Chazan also has to repeat his repetition. Chutz, except for one, and the one that he's going to say is the exception, is the one I just gave as an example, so naughty me giving a bad example. Chutz, this, the exception is the morning service of Rosh Chodesh Cholamoyt. If he forgot and he didn't say Yalav Yavoi, and so if he remembers in the middle, he fixes it up. Like how we said, we go back to that point. But if he finished the repetition, we don't repeat. Why? Because it's it's gonna it's 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 troubling the congregation by holding them back. So therefore we're gonna rely on the leniency. So Michim Al Musaf. We're gonna rely on the fact that he's gonna mention it during the Musaf, the additional service. I will in this but if he remembers before he finishes his repetition, he goes back to the Ratsay. That's not so long, so it's not it's not uh, burdening the congregation. Yud Aleph number 11. A person has an obligation to say the Kedusha with the congregation. So we mentioned it uh, previously, but for, for those not familiar, in the first three blessings, uh, it's it's not in the actual Shemun Esrei, we, we in, in the repetition only, between the, uh, the it, before the last of the, before the end of the third blessing, we say Kedusha. Kedusha means holiness. And it's, it's statements of the various angels about Hashem's connection to the Jewish people. And we're meant to say it together with the congregation. It's a very uh, powerful prayer. So, and also, uh, at least, at least the Amen after the blessing of Holy God and the blessing that Hashem listens to our prayers. This is an these are the main two blessings, and therefore it's a very powerful obligation, similar to Kedusha. Now, obviously, a person should say something, I'm into everything, but, you know, maybe a person's going out, they're just passing through, but if they have these ones, a person should make it their point to answer these. The chain, Kedeshim Sh'omeshlech Sibur, Chayv Hul Anis Alehim. And also, the, when someone says Kaddish, the Chazan says Kaddish, a person should answer Amen. And likewise, when, when we say in the repetition, he says, he gives thank, 
saying he, he gratefully acknowledges Hashem. Should like do a little bow with the congregation, and he should also say the chain and therefore, since these are so important. So obviously, the person comes on time and he and he davens with the congregation. He's going to do all of these things, but since these ones are so important, the chain in this acher. If he came late, lava bix nessus came late to shul. It can happen sometimes. No one here, of course, but you know, it can happen sometimes. Someone comes a few minutes late. But I even in a way oh, yeah. that he, okay, <laughs> in, a, in a way that that he can't say everything together. Congregation, he's a section behind, maybe. But Murchus falls to be a so he's davening at his own uh, pace alone. Im ain a shot of Eris. A person should avoid, a person should try not to do the own Shmon Esrei if it's going to stop him from answering one of these things. He should like uh, uh, plan his davening around answering. Unless he's going to, it's going to become too late. He'll miss the time. So what should he do? The Shana Ach Rach Kais Pal Shmon Esrei. So he should pause. So let's say they're doing Kedusha. He, he's, he's, uh, uh, he should wait, answer the Kedusha, answer the, the Ammains, and then he can start his own Shemunasri. The only place he can't wait is between the blessing of the Jewish people's redemption, which is immediately before the Shemunasri. He shouldn't Pause between that and the Shmon Esrei. You should wait before saying that blessing, because that Sarach last the Tefillah. We want to have the blessing of redemption immediately, like touching, so to speak, leaning against our Davani. Also the Hafsik Benayim, and therefore we're not allowed to make a break between them. The Yamtim Koydim Shir Chadasha. So for those familiar with Davenings, goes back us like a little paragraph before that Shir Chadasha. That's where he should. Wait and answer answer the various uh, omens, and then start his own personal Shmon Esrei. Okay. Yud base number twelve. Yachid Oimed Betfilas Shmon Esrei. You have an individual, and he's in his own personal Shmon Esrei, and he didn't realize he was a little bit behind. He started his Shemona Esrei after the congregation. And about the same time he started, he's just started, and all of a sudden, the repetition starts. So there's no way he can finish his, his uh, Shemona Esrei to answer the Kedusha. So what should he do? If he can be at the same place in his Shemona Esrei as the Chazan is when it's the Kedusha, so after saying the blessing of how Hashem is, resurrects the dead, or will re- resurrect the dead at the, in the Messianic era, God willing, then Oymrim Asiba Kedusha Kedusha is over the Sion or Kedusha Yatsa Oyer or Eina Imam Kodesh or if he's one of the other places where they say the Kedusha and he's at that point. He, so he can't do the other ones. He can do the Shemona Esrei one so I made it a little bit confusing. Let's go back a step. I, in, ca- in case some people aren't familiar with the davening so much, the Kedusha is actually in three places in davening. It's in the blessings of Shema. It's in the Kedusha we have in the repetition. And there's another version of it in the Uvalatsiyam prayer. Now, when a person is doing their own Shema Esrei and the Khan's repetition is going at the same time, if he can coincide that they're at the same place, then he can say the Kedusha together with them because that Kedusha is in a Shema Esrei. It's got the same level of holiness. So it's not an interruption if he's doing it at the same point. But if it's one of the others at the time of Shema or in the in the blessing of the Shema or even in the over the Siyam prayer that's later, it's not the same level of holiness. So he can't do that. He can't answer to that in his Shema Esrei. 
But if they're doing Kedusha of Musaf, even though he's only davening Shachris, he can answer. And likewise, the other way around. The Shachris, Kedush Musaf, Shabbos name. Because the Kedushas of Shab of Shachris and Musaf are the same. Now, they're not necessarily the same words, but the main part, the Kodesh, Baruch, and Yimloich, the main part, so he can answer those um, with everyone. Okay, and that brings us to the the end of the chapter. Um, any questions? All right. Now, um, as a slight pause, slight pause, uh, I actually did show these slides to this class, I think, two years ago. So not this time last year, the year before. Now, not everyone was part of the class then, two years ago. And even those who were, may not have been there on that day. So uh, I I hate to repeat things. You want to keep learning new things. But I just think being that, um, you know, a lot of people wouldn't have seen it, it's worth we're showing again. It's not exactly, it's not the laws we're learning. But as Purim, we're starting to get to the, uh, the Purim season, uh, I thought that I would share these slides um, with everyone. And so those I have seen it was two years ago. It's good, um, good review. Those who haven't seen it, so uh, God willing, you will. Everyone will find it interesting. Just go. Uh... Okay. So. You know the 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 story of Purim is takes place in the capital of Shushan. Right, this is actually this this picture, by the way. Let's give an introduction. Is uh, the ruins of Persepolis? So the Greeks burnt it down, but this is what's uh, this is what's left of it. Now, for many years, uh, people. Uh, who didn't appreciate Torah, unfortunately, tried to claim that the story of Purim could not be true. And they gave two reasons. Number one is that the capital of Persia was not Shushan, it was Persopolis. And number two, uh, they if you look at the Persian palaces that are around, they don't have the same layout, they're not the style in which the Megillah claims the palace in Shushan was. So, therefore, they said it couldn't happen, and they tried to say it was made up. Uh, that is until, of course, they found the palace in Shushan, exactly the same as the Megillah. Right? So, we, we don't need to find it to know that what it says in Torah is true, but it's always nice to be able to uh, to show it and see it with our own eyes. Okay. So, when we share screen... This, by the way, I, I I only see a few people at once. So um, if you have a question, maybe just shout out. Don't don't put up your hand politely because I may not see you. Okay. So I'm sure everyone everyone can read English himself. I'm not going to read it, but as we said, there were people who want to say that the story of Purim wasn't true. The capital wasn't Shushan. No one even heard of Shushan, and they claimed that the Persians did not build the type of palaces described in the Megillah. Okay. So, um, what happened is that archaeologists had thousands of tablets, clay tablets, that were written in cuneiform. and uh, But they didn't know the language. Um, they uncovered several walls, and we'll see a picture of one later, that had huge lots of laws or or stories, history, uh, written three languages side by side. So it was uh, usually Greek, Aramaic, and cuneiform. And 
using the other two languages, which they understood, they were able to decipher cuneiform. And once they deciphered it, they started going back through various tablets they found it. And they found one tablet that said that for 17 years, due to war and famine, the capital was temporarily moved to Shushan. And it said whatever direction it was and whatever the distance was. I don't recall offhand the direction and the distance. But that's that's what that's what um that's what it was uh, that's that's what they saw on these tablets. So they went that distance in that direction from Persopolis, and they found there a village called that the locals currently called Susan. And above the village was a huge plateau, and the mountain had been it had been flattened, and they started to dig, and they found the ruins of Achishverosh's palace. So just in case people are interested in the archaeological side of it, um, we've got the, it was actually first found 1851, right? The Loftus, but they, they, they were really um, doing excavations uh, right until the, the revolution, the Islamic revolution, and they're finding more and more things there. Okay. So, Here's a layout. Here's a layout on the left. And based on the layout on the right, they've made a model of what they presume it, it, it looks like. But um, here's a aerial photo. Now, I'll just uh, put on a, I can make a pointer just to show some things. So if you can see the uh, the pointer, so here's a Crusader castle. Now that's a pretty big building. I mean, it's a massive complex. And over here you see buses and trucks. Now up here is the palace. Now the palace is all of this. So you could fit this Crusader castle, I don't know, five, six, seven times inside Ahasuerus' palace. It's a huge uh, area. Now, we'll, we'll see in a moment what the areas were, but this area here was a huge, uh, was, I guess we'll call it an outdoor area. It's called the Panda. And you can see there's pillars, and these pillars held up a roof, but there wasn't walls. And that's where King Ahasuerus had, had his party with, with the, you know, the entire city of Shushan. Yeah, you know, pretty massive area. Um, okay, so I know the writing is not so clear, but what we see here is the actual palace. So, for example, number one, the king's gate. We know that Mordechai was at the king's gate. That's where he would uh, uh, be a judge and an advisor, and that's where he heard the plot to kill the king. So that's at the king's plate, king's uh, gate. Over here um, is that outdoor area that we spoke about. Now, what's interesting is when they said that the Persians did not build um, palaces like described in the Megillah, well, here we see it quite clearly is. Here's the outer courtyard, the inner courtyard is number four. Uh, number five was the king's courtyard, and number six was the throne room. Sorry, it was the king's apartment and seven was the throne room. So this is the design that they said that they, they didn't build. But we see here in the ruins, we see that it was in all the various places. This was, you know, at the very end, the king's garden. That's his 13. They had over there. So all these areas. So here's a list of the verses and all the places. So every place in the Megillah, there's one room that's in this ruins. It's not mentioned in the Megillah. It's not really relevant to the story. That was a storage room, storage area. But um, otherwise, everything is as in the Megillah, not only in the Megillah, but all the commentaries of the Midrash, of the Talmud, that discuss it. It's all exactly the description down to the, the smallest detail. 
here's a um a stone and a carving of of how they brought the materials down the river and this is like a foundation stone it mentions how uh because the original palace apparently was built by darius and uh when achishverish moved in he expanded it tremendously and this is the foundation stone to his uh extensions yeah it's just some uh they found that this is this is the empire of the 127 countries okay and here's a relief that they found caved in this is actually uh, much larger than than life size so it was the persians and the medes that had a coalition so even when they lined up the soldiers lined up it was uh one persian one mede one persian one mede and it goes on um like that so in this outdoor area they had that had the pillars that held up the roof um they've only got the bases of the pillars now the rest has been destroyed but this is a pillar they found somewhere else on the left um that has the same type of base and they believe probably look quite similar okay now these are utensils that they actually found in the in in the digs in Shushan. Um, so as they're digging around the city of Shushan, they uh, they found the various items, and uh, so that's some of them. It's one of the walls. So when they found it, most of the tiles had fallen off. They're on the floor in front of the wall, but this is what the the interior of the palace um, looked like. And so they, they reconstructed it. It's in one of the museums somewhere. And here's one of these walls with the three languages. So it's quite old, so it's not as clear, but there's one language. In the middle is another language, and on the right is another language. And uh, so these, these walls that had these uh, writings, the three languages they used to, to decipher the uh, cuneiform. Here's a cuneiform tablet. Now, I can't read cuneiform, so I can't tell you which part is what. But in this tablet, this tablet includes the name Mordechai. It refers to Mordechai. Um, it's one of the hero, the hero of the Purim story. So Mordechai is uh, mentioned there. Here's another wall. Uh, again, you know, it's reconstructed. The tiles... Most of the tiles have fallen off, and it's reconstructed in a museum. But see another part of the uh, interior of the palace, what it looked like. So it's quite a fancy uh, place. And we know the whole thing. You know, the king gave a signet ring, and um, to Haman. And once it was sealed with a signet ring, you know, the the law couldn't be changed. So this is probably not. The signet ring of the story, Rabbi, but this what, is found. What group of people say this is not a real holiday? Who said you that? Know, who you say that? Well, I mean, the normally the Bible scholars are universities. You know, I mean, without getting too sidetracked, you have to understand that most of the Bible scholars are well, so-called Bible scholars. I say Bible scholar in, uh, you know, in inverted commas. You know, not literally. Um, essentially, they're usually Christian or a minority of them non-Orthodox Jews. So they have an agenda. They can't, you know, if 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 the five books of Moses are true and it's really dictated from God to Moses, well, then you can't have Christianity. Christianity can't exist. And... Uh, if if the Torah is true, then the non-Orthodox groups also can't exist because it's not compatible. So, um, therefore, people consciously or subconsciously have to try and undermine everything. And they try to say, you know, uh, it was written at this time, written that time. You know, I always find it interesting when you see some article, you know, they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, a copy of one of the books of the Torah, it must have been written earlier than we thought it was. Yeah, In other words, when the Bible scholars who want to deny that it's from God 
said it was written. But still, uh, if if we say the prophet really wrote that book, I see well, what then you're there's no problem being there. So you know, so you have all these uh, all these groups. You know, yeah. one of the things also that I find humorous, if you, you know, I don't I don't think you should waste your time on it, and and I don't usually either. But once in a while, I someone shows me something, asks me a question about it. You have they they like to pounce on textual inconsistencies to prove that there are multiple authors of various things. Well, we now, know that, we know 50, that it's, it's multiple authors. We know that already. What? Well, not the five books of Moses, for example, or each book of the prophets. Now, one of the reasons they have textual inconsistencies is because they're dealing with an English translation of an old English translation of a Latin translation of a Greek translation. Right. And so surprise, surprise, you get textual inconsistencies. That's number one. Uh -huh. Number two, anyone who studies Chumash or Rashi or other basic commentaries so knows that sometimes, yes, the Torah uses unusual words or unusual form of a word. Why? It's to teach us something. Those who study Talmud and various things, right. we see what it's being taught. So there are certain, what for the simple reading is the inconsistency. But it's there for additional purposes. And any legitimate question they can ask has already been asked and answered in our oral tradition and brought down by our commentators. So really, um, you know, the whole, the whole, uh, I don't know, business is the right word, the, the whole uh, academic department is really a joke. But unfortunately, they're the ones who put out the official academic papers. And many Jews who don't know enough about Torah, uh, if they have any exposure to this period, it's through these. And they're being misled. <laughs> it's very unfortunate. Ashanda, that's Ashanda. Rabbi, yeah, it is. Rabbi? Yes. I noticed in one of your um, one of your photos, photographs that you showed, or rather, but pictures that you showed, that there was Mede, Persian, Mede, Persian, Mede, yeah. Persian. Did they ex coexist with the Medes, the Persians? Yeah, the so it was Parasamadai. Yeah, so we hear the Megillah, Parasamadai, that's the Persians and the Medes. They made a coalition. They defeated Babylon together. <clears throat> and actually what happened was they, um, they, so they ruled in unity, literally like that. Every time they'd line up, and there was one Persian king, the next king was a Mede. Next king was a Persian, next king was a Mede. And they had like an assistant king, you know, the, you know, the vice president. So if the, if the king was a Persian, the vice president, you know, the, the assistant king was a, they, was the other one. Weren't they, weren't they Zoroastrians, the Medes, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that actually is a fact in the Purim story, you know, the politics between Haman and Akashverosh, uh, the various religions and different things. But... um. They had that, and and this is why also, by the way, uh, another thing, the so-called uh, scholars, they, looking at ancient Greek records of the Persian kings, they have twice as many kings as, as the Talmud says. Now, number one, the sages of the Talmud lived not long afterwards, so you think it's a more a, uh, accurate historical record, but just leaving it aside, what they've forgotten is that there was a king and an, and an assistant king. And they've counted them as individual kings. So that's how they end up with a larger number. Rabbi? Yes. Rabbi, just um, the, the modern day Kurds say that they are descended from the Medes. And the language is somewhat similar to Persian. So they belong to the pan Iranic uh, group. Yeah. Not, not politically, uh, obviously not politically in favor now with the current regime in Iran, but they believe that back when they were descended from the Medes and, you know, the at that time they described to Zoroastrianism as well, which, you know, is, I mean, it's, it's similar to monotheism, except that it does have the duality of, you know, having yeah. a concept that there is a separate pole for evil. That's not under the control of the good. That's got to be fought by the good. Yeah, 
but you know, it, and it could very well be that they are. I mean, you know. yeah. Okay. I think it was basically Islam that uh, just overwhelmed the whole thing, you know, later. Yeah, well, really, the, the Greeks destroyed that empire. Alexander, we'll call him the so-called great. You know, in Jewish, in non-Jewish history, the biggest heroes or the ones called the great, it's because they killed more people than other people. Someone yes. else. Rabbi? So, yes? I thought Alexander gave, uh, allowed for more freedom, and it was basically... Some of his generals, like Seleucus, who were the ones. Yeah. Who, okay. But at the end of the day, he's called the Great because he conquered the world. He, he killed more people. We look in Jewish history. Who's our heroes? Rabbi Kiva, Rashi, the Rambam. You know, yeah. the heroes for very, very different reasons. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But anyway. Rabbi, Rabbi from the yes. aerial view that from the aerial view that I saw, how many acres of land would would that be? I mean, uh, how much? I don't know. It's huge. I mean, yeah, if I you just, just yeah. at the I, I don't have the number. I'm not even sure where to look. But when you when you look at the, uh, you know, just using that Crusader castle as a, as a, uh, I mean, I mean, that itself is a huge structure. And you see it's yeah. it's dwarfed. Yes. So I couldn't tell the exact amount of acres, but it was a lot. Yeah. So there's some Am other I things right? that they found. Yes. You were saying about the Bible scholars. So when I went to college back in the olden days, I took a course in comparative religion. And the professor was a proud atheist. And he yeah. loved to disprove the Bible and disprove religion by showing the inconsistencies, like you said. And one of his favorite ones was, he said, the Bible says that the Jews wandered in the desert for 40 years. He said, that's so ridiculous because if you look at the distance between where they were and Israel, it's only about 11 days. So why would they wander in the desert for 40 years? That disproves the Bible. Because <laughs> God told them to stay there, you know? Yeah, like, anyway, it, it's not really a proof. That's yeah. right. You know, here's uh, Achashver showing himself fighting lines, you know? So, Here's another view. So again, you got the palace all up here. So the castle. Here's the town of Susan. Now this building with the cone. This is the tomb of Daniel, Prophet Daniel. And this is the inside of the tomb. Right. So according to the midrash, he was killed during the Purim story. Right. So it was a messenger that Esther sent back between her and Mordechai. Right when when because uh, when Mordechai heard of the plot to kill the Jews, he was sitting in 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 um, sackcloth, and people came and told Esther she was sort of uh, in the palace. She, she was she didn't hear the news, and she sent a message. What's going on? The message went back and forwards, and you're gonna have to go to the king. She says, if I go, the, he hasn't called me. I'll wait till he calls me. She says you should go now, and there is a name to this servant. That was his title. And uh, our sages tell us it was actually the prophet Daniel. And the origin of Haman, Haman's ears, of the meaning of, of, of the Hamatashim being Haman's ears, is what happened is Haman got suspicious when he saw this magic on back and forwards, and he uh, caught him, and he, um, he killed him. And he asked him, do you have any last wishes? So he asked to whisper it in his ear. And Daniel bit off part of Achishverosh's ear, leaving him the triangle-shaped ear. That's that's how the... Uh, you mean, the you mean Haman's ear? You mean Haman's ear? Yeah. yeah, Daniel yeah. bit off... Sorry, sorry. Yeah, Haman's ear, sorry. Rabbi? And so one second. So he was actually killed in the Purim story during the duration of Purim story in Shushan. And so... Uh, and in this town of Susan... There's a tomb of Daniel. Yeah, sorry. Someone asked something. No, I'm sorry, Smosha. Isn't it supposed to be a walled city, though? Uh, Shushan? And the, the... Well, I, I, I guess it was. But I mean, I don't see the wall. I don't see the, the I mean, wall. He, 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 so this is just a palace compound. Now, um, you know, this whole area 
was probably once upon a time, I'm sure if they, you know, they don't, they didn't do excavations where the actual town is where people live, you know, so, um, so the, the palace, the city was much more than just the palace complex. So the palace complex, it seemed no one built above it, but the city, um, you know, it looks like they've built around it and so they they haven't done the dig, but some of those wall. Okay, so this is uh, a picture of Akash, or well, picture of engraving in the so the famous King Scepter. That's that's his. You know, often illustrations, or even just in our mind, we more we think of a king like a European king. And they had shorter scepters, but you know, here's a uh, famous scepter that he stretched out towards uh, Esther. So, this is a cuneiform tablet that t speaks about the assassination of Akashvash and the Gemara. It says he was killed about seven years after the story. Um, and this is a uh, yeah, he didn't die a natural death. And uh, here's a tablet that speaks about assassination. And uh, this is not Shushan. This is Hamadan in Iran. This is the tomb of of uh, Esther and Mordechai. So um, I'm just going to change the settings on the share screen because I'm going to show a video just to be able to uh, better settings for the video. And there's someone, of course, Jews aren't really allowed there, but someone uh, went in as an Arab and had some type of hidden camera. And he took a video of the actual tomb walking around. So uh, we can have a look. Everyone sees the video? Yeah? Yeah. Yes, it's terrific. Thank you. It's amazing. A lot of noise. Also. So this is a shul that was uh, there in the, the exterior room. Lady section. I was going to the tomb uh, proper. Is this your own personal video that you got from somebody, Rabbi? Oh, I got it from a site. And someone sent it to me. Wow, oh, it's incredible. So this is this is Mordechai's. Uh, oh, oh mind, mind you, this one's Mordechai. And the one next, the one on the left is Esther. Yeah, so in the little subtitle thing saying, pay attention to all the Hebrew writing, you know, in this uh, Islamic mosque. He's going to another side room, which is also set up for... Uh, Davini. Okay. So that is uh, Hamadan. And uh, the last picture I have here is um, after the... Um, Jewish people were given permission 
not long after the Purim story. To uh, So the king who took over seven years later, he gave the Jews permission. Some theorize it was Esther's son, but not necessarily. But uh, the, he gave the Jews permission to to build the base of Mikdash and establish. And the Hamya, who was leader of the Jewish people, he built a wall around Jerusalem. And this is the last remnant. This, this still is standing. Um, it's the last remnant of the wall of the Hamya. I'm sorry, Rabbi uh, Penina Sarah. Who, yeah. who did you say was the one who built that wall around Jerusalem? Nehemiah. Oh, Nehemiah, yes. Yeah. Well, Ezra was the one who wrote, was, described. And what Nehemiah. year was that wall built? What year was that wall built? Oh, um, it would have been um, exactly yeah, like a rough time. It would have been. Uh, uh, Within a thousand or, years, you know, years. let's say three hundred BCE, something like that. Uh huh. But second base of Mikdash should exist for four hundred twenty years, and it was um, destroyed in the year seventy, probably sixty-eight or seventy, in our calendar. And uh, so, go back four hundred twenty years, and they would have built the wall just before they built the base of Mikdash. So that's um, that's just something about the uh, the city of Shushan. I always f found the story fascinating, and I always, you know, like I said, we don't need to find something to know that the Torah is true. But I always uh, get that. But you know, there's people today, they 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 can't admit that it's been found, and you'll still see in in articles or books written today the same arguments, even though it's there for everyone to see. There's a uh, huge, uh, got museums all over the world with artifacts and, and uh, you know, those two walls that we saw are, are in two different museums. Um, but when people, people have an agenda, they can't, they can't, uh, doesn't matter what facts you show, they can't, they can't deal with it. So that's uh, the city of Shushan. Any other questions on that? That was good. That was great, Rabbi. I enjoyed it. There's a very good book. It's called Shushan. Right? See, Shushan. It's Feldheim. Feldheim publishes a very good. Uh, most of these pictures were taken from that book. Um, but uh, you know, it's got a lot more things that were found and and various angles and. It may say in that book, which I didn't look at a long time, um, how many acres the, or, you know, actually how big the palisite was. Um, so it's actually interesting. Um, the person who put that book together, is Jewish from guy, he's actually uh, was one of the people who worked in the art school Humish. Right? But he obviously is as a obvious Jew uh, he was never allowed to go into Iran to do any of this research but the, the British Museum I think it was or one of the museums in England borrowed the entire uh, had on loan for six months the entire um, collection from the Iranian whichever museum big museum there uh, of the entire city of Shushan everything they found everything at it online. Really? And, uh, yes. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Were the Medes more cooperative with the Yehudim or were the Persians more cooperative with them? I think it was the same. History, I'm just wondering if King Ashveris was a Mede instead of a Persian. You know? He he, he was a Persian. But you know, they were a coalition. It was essentially the same government. Yeah. And and I think how cooperative they were with anyone was all about political expedience at the particular if, if moment. On, I mean, if based on what you're saying, the Kurds are descendants of the Medes, and they tend to be a little bit more, um, huh? you know, cooperative with the, with the with yeah. The Jews I, you know, they they don't have um, yeah. you know, any dis any lack of cooperation 
it wasn't anti-Semitism. It was, you know, we're the government. These are all the conquered peoples, and we've got to keep them under, you know, under under our thumb. That's how we keep an empire. And uh, and we see Achshvash himself. You know, when it was, we we always make jokes and put in plays and kids books. But Achshvash being a fool, no one became the emperor of Persia by being a fool. That's he was right. very cunning. He was anti-Semite himself. When Haman came to him and says, I want to destroy this people, he knew exactly which people he's talking about. And he quite happily went along with it. When he came out that he later thought that Haman wants to kill him and Esther Mordechai saving his life, he quickly changed sides. Not because all of a sudden he became a lover of Jews, but because he's a lover of himself. And it was in his best interest now to get rid of Haman and support the Jews. Really, that's uh, that's... And I think he could say that about the Persians. Rabbi, only. that's always been the story of all the yeah. nations. <laughs> yeah. They support us if, if it's going to benefit them. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, there have been individuals, you know, the righteous Gentiles, we've been individuals who have uh, even given up their life and different things and, and done incredible things. But when we talk about governments and countries, yeah, that's pretty much the... Uh, the That's French, much the, the French had an underground, amazing underground, uh, that saved so many Jews from Nazi, uh, and yet the French supposedly hate the Jews. Yeah, it was individuals, it. wasn't the government? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you, you know, no, but... although there's there's one little island Pacific, I forget what it's called now that that always votes to support Israel on the UN. It's the only one, never abstains, always votes to support. Some little island. Um, I think they're Maori. I've seen the, I've seen them dancing. Uh, yeah. Uh, doing a war dance after October seven. Yeah. Because they were so angry at what happened. Rabbi. Uh, yes. Well, I, I don't want to turn anybody off or get anybody upset, but uh, I remember when I was in yeshiva in the seventies, and I asked my rabbi. Uh, I said, what's the difference between all these different groups? You have the Methodists and the Episcopalians and this group and that group. He says, listen, he says, when the horse lets his load on the ground and the carriage goes through the load and, and cuts it in half, what's the difference between the stuff that's on this side and the stuff that's on that side of the wheel? It's, uh, <laughs> that's pretty well summed up. Yeah, so he was like, yeah. you know, when it, when it came down to it, they had a commonality, which was their hatred of Jews, yeah, and uh, and their affinity for um, Christianity for Yashka. Look, the 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 real righteous Gentiles, the one who keep the seven mitzvahs of the sense of Noach. Um, when Mashiach comes, they will also have a resurrection of the dead. And uh, and they've done whatever Hashem wanted, whatever Hashem the purpose that they were created for, they fulfilled. And uh, and and they can be wonderful people. Unfortunately, it's just uh, there's not many of them around. You see, it's uh, it's uh, wish there were more. And of course, uh, one of the instructions that I gave to to Chassidim is to be able to teach the non-Jewish world as well. Not only to reach out to the our Jewish brethren, teach them Torah and mitzvahs, but also the non-Jewish world, and to try and encourage them to keep the seven mitzvahs. And uh, so, hopefully, we can be more successful in that, and there'll be really? many, many more people who keep uh, what they should be doing. Yeah, I, I, I have to tell you that um, you know, it, 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 by by this thinking, you know, about the seven Noahide laws. There's so many nations that don't follow it, you know, today. Even today, they don't yes. do it. For example, I mean, you know, where there's China. China, for example, where they have wet markets and they, you know, they uh, eat animals alive and, you know, they do yeah. things like that. I mean, I've seen actually seen videos of that nature, you know. And, uh, you know, you would think that such a civilized country like that where, you know, they're, where they have such a high, you know, high IQ and they're very intellectual. That you know that they 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 actually carry you know they go into restaurants where they eat live animals and you know live yep. you know, 
It's it's you in, know, it's, in it's school, very ironic, you know, it's very ironic. When I was in high school, which wasn't last week, they uh we we saw a film of in Indonesia. It's a delicacy. They had monkeys in cages under the um table and just the head above the table and they opened the skull and they, they ate the brains. And the monkey's screaming away. It's like part of the entertainment. And they uh, they eat the brain while it's alive. There is a terrible illness that some I really that. did that today. You really did that to a monkey today? I really needed to hear that. Oh, you needed to hear that. No. The sheer shkoyah. <laughs> Sorry to, uh, to upset your stomach. But we're talking about, we're talking about unfortunately, there's things. And these these are, we look at countries that officially, you know, and this is so there's, although we must say we shouldn't get, we shouldn't get negative about it. We actually have come a long way, you know. If you, there's no such thing as straight graph, you know. Every graph goes up and down, you know, like this. But if you look at the world, even 500 years ago, three, 400 years ago, it's where we are today. Every country today, even if they don't have proper human rights, they at least pay lip service. 500 years ago, is no such thing. The serfs just belonged to the 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 royalty. You know, there was a, the there was a nobleman's horse, then his dog, then came the uh, the commoners. You know, you look at at, at so many areas. Uh, although we still have a long way to go, if you look where we're coming from, it's actually incredible how far the world has has, has gone. And sometimes when we look at the neg- the negative things, we think. Well, how can Mashiach come like so far? But if you look at the big picture of like where we were and and, and how far we've achieved, Rabbi, we actually realize Rabbi. we really as a as a as a human race, we was we really are close. Yeah, Moshe. So I'm not with Moshe's opinion. Yeah. I mean, it's I'm with Moshe. Yeah. Um <clears throat> I just want to say that of the, of the there are certain elites, according to many rabbi uh, doctors. And even some rabbis that are trying to take us back to that era and enslave us all under the World uh, Health Organization, so-called, uh, which Dr. Zelenko used to call the World Homicide Organization. And uh, of course, the WEF, which uh, the, the the man who runs it is the son of a major Nazi who armed uh, Hitler's forces in World yeah, War II. I mean, look, so could, stand could be. For something to try and reverse all the developments that the civilized world has gone through in order to in, in, in enshrine our freedoms and our personal rights. It won't be yeah. under these leaders. Well, take over. it's a shame we can we can keep plugging away, keep plugging away. We we are we are in a in a in a situation where we, you know, you, you just look at today. Um, although the internet is is often used for not positive things, but the way the, the the message, the true message can be spread to the entire world. You know, we live in a time where, you know, a person can can learn Tyra at any time of day or night in pretty much any language. We live in a time where where books can be printed or things can be found online for uh, a pittance in relative to what it used to cost. Everything is available. Everything. And that's the test. Hashem is saying here, you want? I'll, you had, didn't have before. I'll give you everything. That's what a beautiful point. Uh, beautiful point. It? Also, you yes. know, uh, in the 1800s, we were still burning witches. That's I right. mean, you know, we're sure going to. That's right. And if you just, just look at this class an example. I mean, even... Ten years before this class started, I mean, technically there was the technology that was, you know, but but think about ten years before this class started, it would have been impossible. No one would have thought of it. How could? And we have people, okay, many people in Florida, but many people from all over the place. It's just incredible. It's incredible, and uh, Shem has given us a a blessing, and uh, God, we're going to take advantage of the blessings for the positive. Amen. And run out of time. I'm hesitant to keep people back. So, uh, I guess we'll wish everyone a wonderful week. 
You too, and, Rebbe. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very, very, thank, thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. Thank, thank you, Rabbi. 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 Thank you, Rabb